on. We are now live for 11 p.m. on Saturday. Let's see. First thing I'd like to do is uh, figure out how to maneuver my camera. This is a informational. Here we go. Hello, everyone. This is an informational video, a 411 episode that we have. And it uh, looks like that's quite a halo I have. Let's see, I'm gonna have to do something about that light. Well, very easily remedied. There we go. That is my uh, green water. Something that we can uh, arrange or talk about at a later date. Hi, Malik. I'm glad you could join us today. I know it's probably uh, not exactly the time that you're uh, typically live streaming, but this is a Saturday afternoon when I'm working in the fish room. And this is um, the place where a lot is happening. So I'm going to take a wonderful opportunity to get to know a little bit about how to talk to different ones and to share with them uh, some question and answering at the end. and. Uh, to pick a topic of just this small little fish room. Hi, non-stop. Looks like we've got uh, a number of people uh, making comments. I'm glad about that. Thank you. And uh, appreciate that very much. So, first thing is uh, to give a little highlight about uh, this fish room. Uh, this fish room uh, is very small. Non-stop Aquatics is here. Malik is here. And uh, this particular fish room is very small as you can see we've got uh, tanks along the entryway and there's uh, my sink and I'm just gonna make a, a simple maneuver around the room give you an idea of what's going on what's happening and uh, some of the fish over here we're gonna take a look at in a few and you can see in the reflection of this tank actually the whole tank the whole room so here's the room. It's got more tanks on the left and some tanks on the right. This is my uh, breeding rack and I call this the workbench. And I'll be explaining something uh, about how the workbench is all about, what, what I use it for and why I like it. And looks like Udacite Green is with us. Thank you, another one joined. As a few people are joining, we're going to uh, just take a couple peeks at some of the tanks before we get into our subject for today and there we have it some of the some of them are quite up high and there's a reason for that too so um, there's tanks from the ground level all the way up and that's how we maximize the space here and this little guy just came out looks like he just came out of his uh, cave today a little looks like a little pleco I think he came out only. This is the first day I've seen him. Looks like he came out just because I think he's here because of the live stream. He wanted to get in on it. Hmm. So, today we're going to talk rams. One of the reasons why we're talking about a certain subject like on rams is because there's been a lot of discussion, there's been a lot of questions, and people ask things, and how do I breed rams, and what do I feed them, and how do I feed them? And so, if that's the case, with many questions, I thought it would be nice if we had an opportunity to actually um, let you ask those questions. So, what kind of, oh, uh, the pleco? Uh, Malik, that was just a bushy nose. That was a bushy nose. But it's interesting because that's the first spawn of this next generation of uh, Ancestrous Bushy Nose that I have. I don't have any of the ones I had last year, so I just picked out some really nice younger ones to uh, grow up. I'm keeping just a limited few. And it's kind of interesting because I use those little baby Bushy Nose for a purpose other than just raising them for sale. And if you're curious as to what that is, it has to do with the tanks. When we look at the tanks, You'll see exactly uh, why I put a little baby bushy nose because they're great cleaners. <laughs> they will keep a tank spick and span. 
Now, first question is, why breed German Blue Rams? Well, I started with them when I was about 13 years old, but that's not when I, that's not the full story. I got some when I was very young and I loved them. I thought they were just the most beautiful fish I had ever seen before. Well, it wasn't long after that, at 13 years of age, I had too much, um, uh, it was just too much going on in my life. I was going to school and, and I didn't have the real good facilities for that. So, sadly, I had to give up my fish, but I knew I wanted to get fish again someday. Well, now, many years later, in fact, probably over, well over 40 years later, um, now that I got fish again, I decided to, to try them. I uh, get back into the my favorite fish I had when I was a a, a youngster, and uh, I didn't think I was going to do well because everything I read about them high temperatures, high temperatures. You got to do this and you got to do that. They're sensitive. They die easy, and everybody kept saying the same thing. And I said to myself, self, there's got to be something more to it. And uh, what I've learned is that it depends on where you get your fish. And some rams are a good line, and others may have their tendencies to be, well, just like that, uh, weak, or maybe prone to issues. So we're going to look, uh, take a look, quick look at, uh, first of all, I'll show you some of the adults that I have. And uh, let's take a quick look at that. We're going to um, change the camera. Go up to the top bench here. Take a peek. Sometimes they come to the front when I'm here because they know I'm going to feed them or something. And I have this tank as a four gallon. This one has a pair of electric blues, which they're hiding. I didn't know they were camera shy, but apparently they are. This one here is also uh, two pairs. I have two pairs, a B and a B prime. I just marked them with a, a pair that resides in the front and a pair that resides in the back. And I guess they've never seen my tablet before because they're hiding. Wow, they all are. Well, there's a pair over in the last one. There's a pair in each one of these. And you can see there's a pair looking at us. Oh, looky here. Here's the a female came out. To say hello she's looking good she's really looking smart these are the pairs that are young but uh, they're up here in the top shelf because that's the warmest part of the room and as you know um, they can tolerate a uh, little warmer temperatures but I don't try to keep them up higher than 82 usually about 80 to 82 max for the breeders and when I'm rearing this fry they're lower like 78 degrees to 80 somewhere in there not oh he came out here's the boy there we go this pair um has fry will be looking at their fry too over here in just a minute so while i'm here just wanted to show you on the other side i've got a pair also in this particular tank it's a five gallon on the other side of the other rack and uh, this particular tank is an experiment. These are females that are um, being fattened up, ready to go, so that after they spawn, uh, notice the beautiful, looks like an electric blue in the back there. She's really looking sharp. And so after they spawn and they start chasing the females, and if they're not ready, I'll just, I'll just pull one from the pool and uh, we'll give another one uh, a chance and as you can see these these ones are actually ready to go so that's the breeders those are just some of them um, I've used different spots and we're gonna walk over now to the nursery this is the nursery I'll give you an overall the nursery is um, basically where I do all the work and uh, the eggs are taken away after a day or two sometimes right away or just depends on when I have a moment and they're put in these breeder boxes so they kind of start over here 
Uh, actually, there's one. Do I have any eggs right now? Yeah, I do, down here. Here's some eggs that I just took out last night. These were for some young pair, and uh, no methylene blue. I just wanted to see how well they would do. And this particular um, uh, couple of batches is from the D pair and the B pair. And then as they get older, uh, I do other things. For example, the next stage, um, they're off in the wiggling wigglers. And these are not heated. They're just the fish room temperature. This is uh, um, a batch of wigglers. And then this is the C pair. We just looked at the mom and dad a minute ago. Let's see if I can get them focus here. There we go. More wigglers. Maybe that's a little better. This looks like a sizable batch. Not bad. This is uh, another, another batch that's starting to go free swimming now at this stage of the game I'm gonna pull the and I'm gonna pull the, um, the ceramic in fact I, I don't see why not I can't do it right now I'll just show you what I do I just take out the ceramic these have been hatched and I'm just going to let's just take a look at what we have and we just kind of gently shake them off of the ceramic and they go to the bottom and uh, looks like we've got a good number there and so I give it a good shaking and they're kind of sticky so sometimes they'll stick on to the ceramic but shaking them out like this and that's it and uh, they're out so let's take a good look at them here they are and they're off and running another day or two they will start to eat by by means of some paramecium now I have paramecia going up here these are bottles of paramecia I don't know how well you'll see them but I'm going to show them to you anyway I know a way to show you the paramecia and uh, before we do that just want to show you the different uh, stages we have these here's an electric blue pair not much going on in here a few the the electric blues don't produce as well they're more of an inbred type of fish so they're more sensitive to changes and so forth here we have a batch it looks like a very sizable batch now on baby brine shrimp so let's see if we see oh this electric blue batch is amazing and I wanted to point out something about this batch I see out of all the hundreds of fish that have hatched only one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe. Only six little eggs turned white. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six or maybe there's two, there's seven. That's all in the entire batch that turned white. Every other egg hatched. That's going to be a great um, batch coming up. So. This one here again, already uh, free swimming on baby brine. They look great when they're this this size. Their belly is swollen. And I'm gonna show you how I feed them in a minute. Here is an earlier electric blue batch. And they're the oldest ones I have. And they're doing very well. And finally over here. So once they get to the age where they're going to be coming out of the breeder boxes, um, they go from, once they're free swimming and eating, they're going to go over to this uh, system where I have a seven and a half gallon tank. It's, it's, old, it's an old sump tank. And it um, is very narrow and it's perfect. It puts these little breeder boxes at eye level and allows me to pay close attention to them. And I can also uh, show you how I take out the um, the uh, debris or mulm at the bottom. Once uh, they get too big for those breeder boxes, here's one I just moved. Here's uh, a breeder box I dumped into this 10 gallon uh, just a day or two ago. And as you can see, they fill it up so quick. And this is a system where I've got a, uh, a drain on the back. I just turn the knob and it drains. And then I just turn a knob and I refill. 
so they need water changes on a regular daily basis so I will show something about water management maybe on another occasion today is just an overview of the rams um, I use five gallons too when they come out of the breeder box but here is what happens they grow and if you're wondering how you can have this many fish in a five gallon it's very simple the way it works is you have to change their water so I'm going to like give you an illustration of how to change their water see this tube I'm gonna turn on the valve right there and now I should have water coming out and that's it on the back of the tank you see an overflow there's another video on my channel that shows how to build those and it's going to overflow any amount of water I drip in it's going to drip out and so I just let it run like this and I change out probably 20 gallons a day so each tank will get about a 10 gallon water change every day so it's like getting your in a hundred percent actually 200 percent change per day <sighs> it's a lot of water but that's what's happening so now finally when they're these are going to be moved out tonight after the live stream these are going to be moved out to the uh, 40 gallon up here and these is more like a finishing uh there's a there's one over here a little smaller these have smaller fish but they're ready to they're just almost ready to go into the 40 gallon this is the finishing tank and what happens in here is um is bigger and they start coloring up and this thing gets uh water changed every day um by about those it looks like about three inches that's that actually represents about three minutes it takes to refill so that's the line. So if I drop the water level down to below the bottom line, and then I just refill it with a simple turn of a knob. And there's the knob right there. Simple as B. So if, if you can't do water changes easily, then it's a lot of work. But since it's so easy to do, it's a lot simpler. Well, that's enough of me talking, and that's enough of the introduction. Uh, I want to, before we do the question and answer, if anybody has any questions or for me, I'm going to um, specifically show you a couple of things that I do. I'm going to um, actually pull down, if I can, uh, this one. This is, uh, let's see if I can demonstrate this. My lights just went out. Hold on. All right. Now, this this is the paramecia. I don't know. If, I'm going to hold a flashlight up. Now, I can see. Can you see the paramecia? That is fry food. So this starts going in, but not a lot, But because there's so many of them, you can just put a squirt into a breeder box and they'll have plenty of food and it's small enough that they'll be able to live off that for about a day and then the uh, next day I introduce maybe a vinegar eels and then by the third day I start introducing along with the paramecium vinegar eels I start adding in baby brine shrimp and that's when their stomachs start to explode and get orange and once they're all orange I just stick completely with the baby brine shrimp also just see if I can move the camera a little bit show you the baby the baby brine shrimp is developed in those hanging I have hanging bottles and as you can see they're here one two three every 36 hours um, there's a, one of the bottles, so it's actually every 12 hours. I've got one in the morning, one in the evening, one in the following morning. And then I just take out the shells. I use this handy dandy feeder. It's actually a strainer. And this strainer is, in fact, uh, what they call an oil separator. I buy it at the dollar store. And I buy it 
for um, real cheap there. It's this one's happened to be stainless steel. As you can see, there's a lot of shrimp on there. This water is being constantly circulated with the larger tank, the seven and a half gallon behind it. So it's heated and circulated. So the water, no matter even if there was some decomposing of the back of the food and so forth, the water is kept pretty good, fresh that is. And it's not really a big issue. So I'm gonna do this last one. And then we're going to, um, oh, I forgot about this one here. These guys need it, they're, they're looking good. And finally, this one, they're not quite free swimming. So I'm using, for example, in that case, I'm going to use the paramecia. This is a, a very special baster. It's one that's called no drip. So I can take the paramecia and just, that's a lot of paramecia right there. That's a lot of paramecia. And I do use some microworms. Now, when the fish themselves are at the surface and they're hovering at the surface, I don't use microworms because there's no point in using microworms if they're at the top because microworms will just hang out at the bottom. So I watch the fish. At, at some point, they're down at the bottom eating and it will be another day and then they'll be at the top and then two days later, they'll come back down. So there's this cycle. So I use it only when they're at the bottom periods. I don't know if you were able to catch all that. This is an experiment today, a first. All right. And the last thing I didn't want to forget, um, the food that I feed once they come out of the breeder boxes and the other tanks is this, Dr. Basilier Biofish Food. This is the medium size, which is really 0.5 to 0.8 millimeter, very small, and uh, they love it and they uh, grow very well on it. They're crazy about it. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the little tour and I know there's been some questions. So let's just take a, start taking a quick look at some of the questions. Um, you're worried about the, the vinegar eels changing the pH. Well, that's a good question, but I have found that if, if you can, as you can see on the breeder boxes, there's two kinds. The ones over here are, are being cycled. So the little bit of any little tiny bit of uh, vinegar eel that happens to go into the, to the breeder box might be a little bit, but it's not going to change much of anything. Here's how I do the vinegar eels. I take this, and I take this, and I take a coffee filter, like this, put it in the top, like this, and I take the vinegar eels, like so, and I pour them in like that. And then I let it drain, and the vinegar is not going into the tanks. However, the, some of the vinegar eels will get through the coffee filter, but not all. There's so many they get caught up in the filter. When this is finished, I will just take this material and dip it into here. You'll see a cloud of vinegar eels go in. And so you're not really adding any vinegar itself. So this is why I can use vinegar eels and this particular containers here do not get cycled with a tank on behind because they're too small. If I did that, they, the babies would get sucked into the weir. And I'm using in the weir this 
little section here. It's uh, it's actually the bottom of an intake filter. They're very cheap. You can just get them. I have a bunch of them, and I buy them from um, Amazon, or you can get them from eBay Ch through China. They're so cheap. Cut off the bottom and just about that much high and I use them for the weirs. Now they get clogged so daily they're washed out so that the uh, fish don't, the, the water doesn't overfill. But I hope that answers your question. Uh, I don't have an issue with uh, pH or anything like that because on top of that, after you feed the vinegar eels, after you feed any type of the fish in these breeder boxes, uh, I'm going to clean out the, the breeder box. 50% water change um, daily as a minimum daily so how I, how do I do that well that's another little trick here is my uh, a piece of hard line on the end of airline and then very carefully I can get out like for example here is a good example is a lot of previous brine shrimp from the previous feeding now, I'm keeping my finger over the end, so I can control the flow and the suction with my left hand. And I'm just now going to just do, 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 and it just kind of takes out any dead fish or any, and it just, in, in a few minutes, I got to spot this, and it's done. So, that gives you an idea how easy that is. So, yes. Oh, my camera's in the wrong spot. You didn't get to see that. Let me try that again. All right. So, wait a minute. Did anybody get to see the vinegar eels? My mistake. Thank you, truth seeker. I wish uh, I had a little beeper or something. I can see the comments. I don't know what you saw or didn't see, but uh, I'm going to just show you again. I use this for the vinegar eels, and so it's a funnel on a container. And now that I've poured it in here and it's drained out, see, there's so many vinegar eels in here, and I just do this. And there might be a small, tiny bit of residual vinegar on here. I'm going to put it inside out and just kind of dip it. And I see, you won't see it, but I see a cloud of vinegar eels there. So there's quite a few in there. And then I can use this um, maybe in another tank too. But dipping this paper where it's, it's collected a lot of vinegar eels will do the trick. And that is something that's a lot smaller than, a whole lot smaller than your um, baby brine shrimp. Okay, back, back to the real deal. Sorry for my inexperience, but I just wanted to um, um, show you at the uh, breeder rack there. Actually, I wonder if, I wonder what would happen if I did this. This is still a learning process. What if I was here and we were looking together and then I didn't, I wouldn't have to, hmm to see how that works using this camera. Huh. Okay. Maybe this is a better way to talk. Okay, well, we learn something every day. Leek has his uh, unique and special spot as well, so I guess everybody does. Let's see what some of the comments were. I appreciate everybody taking a moment to show their support. Yes, appreciate it very much. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so here's what I do. Now this is Re Reggie De Andre Andrade says a uh, problem about they get stuck on the sponge weir. He's absolutely right. And what I've done to overcome that is simply not use the sponge weir and I don't use the cycler on the breeder box until they are eating baby brine shrimp and they're big enough and strong enough to swim away because the current, even though it's just dripping, 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 the current for a tired, weak, swim, rest, swim, rest, swim, rest, fry is 
is going to catch him and he's not going to have the strength to pull away and that's what happens so i've had my experience with that too so when i use this thing it's only at that point when the fry are big enough and you know what my my experience has been that it actually doesn't require that you have the running water running through the reader box until they're at that stage where they're eating baby brine shrimp anyway because they're producing more excrement and they're causing more ammonia and so forth from their eating process, the metabolism of eating. But when they're very, very small fry, they don't foul the water as much. It's the food you put in. So if you're changing half the water after each feeding, or you, you in this stage, which is only done at the very beginning, at the young stage, then you can appreciate that that the um, water change is going to be sufficient to keep up with uh, any uh, of the food pollution that might be introduced. So that's that's my take on that. I appreciate that comment though because it's been my experience exactly the same way. Well, let's see. I've missed a few questions. You know, now that. Um, Oh wow, that's a lot of questions I've missed. You're gonna have maybe somebody's gonna have to spice up or say a few more for me. Um, in my videos, somebody made a comment um, about the box filters. Well, the box filters are only for the adult fish. Uh, I do use some, uh, mostly sponge filters for all the small fish, and even on the the um, water change, there is a sponge filter or an intake over the siphon so that when I turn the water knob and I am adjusting the uh, turning on the siphon or which will drain the tank uh, fry will not get sucked out so but the box filters I use along with also Okay, non-stop aquatics. I'm always losing fry after a few days of swimming with parents. So you're, you're, you're breeding them with the parents. Now, I've done that too. I had a pair up here, and uh, if you see some of my, my videos, um, they, they will raise their own youngsters. But the mortality rate is a little higher because, and I believe that they're not finding enough food because there's a lot in a particular batch. And so, if they're not finding enough food for all of them, very small stomachs, if they don't find that little paramecia in time between meals, which is like a constant eating process, if they're not finding that, they will just wither and get weak and wither and die off. So, the reason we put them in the breeder boxes and keep them in the smaller tanks is because this way they're concentrated on the eating and eating the smaller food. So, that's the key to doing bigger batches but if you want the enjoyment of watching fish raise their own with their parents yeah you can do it and you'll get some fry out it's just that you're not going to really you really shouldn't expect to have all the fry survive in that case you really shouldn't because a lot can happen in a tank of whatever is in there and and um, the fry get lost and that's my answer to that one non-stop aquatics but I hope um, I hope uh, I answered your okay um, now yeah so it looks like uh, mayhem herpetarium is also uh, good on sponge filters. Sponge filters are the way. They're the way of the future because they're the way any fish room. Now remember um, this fish room is very small but it's only 100 square feet and I've got over 30 tanks in here and uh, maybe they're small ones but there's still 30 tanks to attend to and they all run on well, they all run on sponge filters with the exception of my 90 gallon, which um, is right to my left. And that's my barb tank. And it has uh, uh, some external filters, canister filters that keep uh, good flow because barbs love good flow. But maybe in the future, we'll talk more about the future of that tank. Now, I want to know, is there any other questions I missed? 
I don't know. I, I'm working without a thousand subscribers. So unfortunately, this is the problem is that I don't have all the tools available to me until I reach a thousand subscribers. I only need 75 more. So tell your friends, <laughs> tell others to uh, subscribe. And then that way, um, when I'm able to do this little episode on, uh, on Saturdays at 411, at informational episodes, I hope that I'm able to um, share some things some tips. I'm going to cover the water management and all these tanks and how it works. Uh, I'm going to cover in a future, future episode uh, maybe some of the other species I have. Uh, I've got uh, several. I've got, in fact, just to give you a tidbit, turn it around. Right here, we're looking at a tank. This is a tank that has fry in it so small you can't even I can't even show them to you but that's um, uh, a tank of Odessa barbs Odessa barbs so we're gonna watch those grow now there's also an experiment being done here to see about them let's see anything else any questions I'm going to oh um, I didn't mention methylene blue I'm going to uh, mention that right now real quick. The methylene blue, when the eggs come out from the parents, if the parents are there, they'll eat the, um, the bad eggs. Any fungus comes, parents will eat it. But if I'm taking it away and they gotta sit in here for three days, and I always take a longer three day period because there's no heaters in these things. Now I can, there's another option, is to take this thing and turn it around and set it, hook it on the inside of the tank. And then the water becomes the same temperature and I can heat the, heat the tank and it heats the breeder box. I've done that before. Excuse me. <coughs> but that, that, that's a little trick that mm, it has some benefits, but I have not noticed that there's any reason to worry about temperature and that when they're very small, the eggs, they just take maybe 12 hours longer to hatch. So what? So when I get the eggs, because of the probability that it could fungus and spread the fungus and kill them all, I use five drops of methane blue. So in this particular size, five drops of methane blue. That's it. I also notice by the date in my system of knowing when exactly they're going to hatch, because just before they hatch, I pull the eggs out and put them just in pure water no methane blue when I take the eggs out they go into RO water because I don't want any calcification of the eggs the RO water is there until they hatch and once they hatch there really is no more RO water after that it's just tap water so they're raised completely in tap water it's just the egg hatching process that I use the um, RO for I hope that was helpful uh, this was not intended to be a very long, a very uh, uh, lengthy discussion. It was just to show you the German blue rams, and I have a few electric blues here, and uh, how it's done here in a process, assembly line basically, you can see. Um, once they start coloring up in the 40 gallon, that's when they're off the market because I don't have any more tank space to just grow them out larger. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that. Is there any other questions? I do, it says, what other fish do you breed? Well, interestingly enough, if you hang around for next, next Saturday, I might show you a peek at my discus. I kind of skipped that tank today, but I do have baby discus growing up and they're with the parents. Maybe I can show that to you um, maybe next Saturday. Okay, oh. Here's a tip from uh, Regis de Andrade. Hydrogen peroxide instead of methylene blue. One teaspoon per gallon reapply every day. I've never tried that. Sounds interesting. Maybe something I could try, but um, the methylene blue works and I do take the fish out of the methylene blue before they're actually swimming in it. So it's just for the eggs, the surface of the eggs and once they hatch, they're in fresh water, and that seems to do the trick. Well, thank you all very much. I hope that uh, if you're not a subscriber, that you 
click on the subscribe button just because it's an opportunity for you to pick up a tip or two from somebody who also runs a small fish room and uh, from my experience I can share some things with others that maybe help them in their fish room and then of course uh, there's going to be probably no doubt more questions as time goes on so I'll let you uh, think about uh, what I said and, and formulate your questions and maybe next week or even add a comment down below because I do answer all comments so if you do make a comment on this video um, you'll get a response so that's something that I can do also let's see anything else um, I do have um, experience with uh, some plecos I have uh, actually two or three kinds of plecos two or three kinds of corridoras about four or five species of barbs and uh, even some Epistogramma borrelii, which uh, actually I'm using in this tank here behind. And here, one day we'll feature those and we'll zoom in on the borrelii. They're, they're right now getting close to about a half inch to maybe three quarters of an inch and uh, starting to show their sex. So these are the opals. So they're very, very attractive. I got a couple of adults at the show. So uh, it's been... Uh, uh, quite a few minutes past 20 but we keeping it under um, for a short period I hope everybody enjoys their Saturday no matter where you at where you are in the world and maybe most of you are in here in Canada this is live from Toronto area the greater Toronto area Brampton and I'm gonna sign out and I thank you all very very much for coming in to join me for this very special looks like we have um, good thumbs up thank you so much for doing it and uh, we'll be talking next week oh before we go I'm from England great that's fantastic having it at 4 11 maybe it's not so bad or Saturday late Saturday night for you so yeah oh Malik you want some opals too yeah I know they're out there but um, they're, they're a nice, nice fish. Thank you all for joining, and uh, I'm going to sign out now so you can get back to your Saturday and back to your fish room water changes. And may all of your fish water be changed regularly. <laughs>